This is a film about war, a world war, a war which in all my years as a correspondent has somehow escaped my attention. It is a war fought in more than a hundred countries, regardless of ideology, in communist and capitalist countries, in Muslim, Buddhist, and Christian countries. It's a war that has directly involved President Eisenhower, President Johnson, President Nixon, President Carter, Chiang Kai-shek, Mao Zedong, the Dalai Lama, Mr. Khrushchev, and Father Christmas. Of course, claims by both sides in wartime are extravagant, but there is some truth in their dispatches. For example, according to one side, the entire American army has adopted its name as the very symbol of freedom and the American way. One side claims to have captured China. The other side says it has taken Russia. Indeed, no conquerors, religions, or empires have spread themselves so completely across the planet as these two superpowers, with their rallying slogans of life, liberty, and the pursuit of thirst, and we are the essence of capitalism, and we must save the world. I refer to the bittersweet war between those giants of carbonation and regurgitation, Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. This saga of power and conquest began in the American Civil War in the 1860s when the Yankees beat the Confederates. The rural South was devastated. The southern capital of Atlanta, Georgia was burned to the ground. One observer wrote, dislocation and bitterness are rampant, along with melancholia, hysteria, guilt, sick headache, biliousness, drunkenness, heart palpitations, and impotence. But help was on the way. Out of the gloom came the quack doctor, a combination of traveling con man and faith healer who peddled potions of mysterious ingredients. One such medicine was called the ideal brain tonic and was invented by John Pemberton. The year was 1886. The temperance movement had become powerful and Atlanta went dry. What happened next, wrote the historian John Gaff, changed the course of civilization. The ideal brain tonic became the intellectual beverage and temperance drink, better known as Coca-Cola. Everything was a great struggle. Everything we had to do in the South to get ahead after the war was to work three times as fast as anybody of our, uh, any anybody up in Yankee Land. We just had to work like a, like the devil to get um, get things done. We did had nothing. Everything was destroyed down here. But here was Pemberton, who had all these pharmaceuticals, and he had an inventive mind, and so he liked to put together these syrups. And this particular one syrup was singled out by Pemberton as, po as a possible soft drink. Alas, Doc Pemberton was no businessman and sold the formula and title of Coca-Cola for a mere $2,300. The buyer was Asa Candler, a prosperous Atlanta chemist who launched the image and myth of Coca-Cola in the 1890s and became one of the earliest pioneers of modern-day consumer marketing. Candler, deeply religious, sold Coca-Cola as the very symbol of American wholesomeness. And with the South gripped by Old Testament revivalism and prohibition, it was all perfectly self-serving. God was happy, Coca-Cola was happy, and the consumers were happy. How could they be otherwise? Coca-Cola was then said to be part cocaine and was just the right color to disguise an illegal and uniquely refreshing slug of whiskey. This was old Atlanta in the state of Georgia, the setting for the movie Gone with the Wind, and the world headquarters to this day of Coca-Cola. Inside Coca-Cola's granite monument, the atmosphere is hushed, almost cathedral-like, with precious art and antiques in the executive suites, and ice-cold bottles of the real thing, born on silver platters. The Coca-Cola company naturally doesn't like the word empire. But this is the center of a uniquely American empire, covering 147 countries. Coca-Cola has been going for almost a century. And during that time, revolutions have happened, wars have been fought, and regimes overthrown. 
But except for hiccups here and there, Coca-Cola has survived and grown richer and richer. Perhaps what is most extraordinary about Coca-Cola is its power of illusion, its ability to persuade generations through advertising that its product is much more than merely a bottle of sticky, sweet, colored water. When a Coca-Cola man was asked which came first, America or Coca-Cola, he said these immortal words. Let me put it this way. When you don't see a Coca-Cola sign, you have passed the borders of civilization. The borders of Coca-Cola civilization were first extended outside the United States by Asa Candler's brother, a Methodist bishop of the Hellfire variety. Cuba had just been claimed as a spoil of the Spanish-American War, and a pattern was set. When American troops marched in, Coca-Cola would follow. Cuba is our ripest mission field, rejoiced the bishop. I see a wretched population stretching out its hand to us appealingly. What we need is for these people to think and feel like Americans. The first Cuban bottling plant was opened in 1906, and Bishop Candler set about finding Methodist converts who would consume Coca-Cola and its secret formula. If we had patented the formula, under American law, it would have gone into the public domain after 50 or 60 years. And all the competitors would... would well, if they uh, would wanted it, they could it. have taken it all, but mm. the, um, the... So we didn't patent it. It's not protected. It never has been protected by law. It's just been protected by secrecy and keeping it hidden. All the same, Coca-Cola has waged a continuous legal war against those who dare to imitate the real thing. In the year 1916 alone, the court struck down Fig Cola, Candy Cola, Kaola, Coconola, Solar Cola, and King Cola. One of them survived, however, and today, from this sculpture-strewn American Versailles near the town of Purchase, New York, the Pepsi Cola Company rules its empire in 145 countries. Like Coca-Cola, it is Pepsi's franchise system that has made it such a huge multinational. Both provide essential ingredients to a network of bottling companies which promote and sell the soft drink according to local conditions and local politics. Each bottler, said an executive, is like a client government which will survive and prosper as long as it looks after our interests. Pepsi was invented in 1893 by Caleb B. Bradham, a Carolina chemist who claimed it could relieve upset stomach and peptic ulcers, thus Pepsi-Cola. By 1909, Pepsi had expanded to 24 states of America, but World War I changed that. As the world economy staggered, the price of sugar rose sharply, and Pepsi mistakenly invested. When sugar prices collapsed, so too did the ambitions of Caleb B. Bradham, who returned to his humble drugstore. Pepsi was not only bankrupt, but its bottles were exploding everywhere as the result of fermenting cheap molasses. Meanwhile, God-fearing Coca-Cola launched a new bottle, wickedly shaped like a woman, as well as a new owner, Robert Woodruff, whose consortium of northern banks had bought out Asa Candler in 1919 for $25 million, the biggest business deal the South had ever known. Woodruff established a foreign department and set out to sell Coke to the world with an image so different from Candler's symbol of Christian mission that during the 1920s, the Women's Temperance Union launched attacks on what it called the Coca-Cola curse, claiming Coke had fallen into the decadence of modern life and was as sinful as the demon rum, whose consumption prohibition had managed to increase, of course, along with the sales of Coca-Cola. By the end of the 20s, with Pepsi down and almost out, Coca-Cola produced its most remarkable advertising campaign. It invented Santa Claus. That is, it converted the legend of St. Nicholas to the modern image of Father Christmas, a jolly white-bearded character dressed in the colors of the Coca-Cola company. From now on, Santa was the real thing. 
In 1929, Wall Street crashed, but not Coca-Cola, whose profits were to double by 1940. By contrast, Pepsi was struggling to survive. Ironically, the Depression was to change that. During the Depression, Coca-Cola was known as the living room drink, whereas Pepsi's place was in the kitchen. Pepsi fostered its image as the drink of the working man who longed to work, of the little guy down on his luck. Its slogan was, twice as much for a nickel too, which meant that you got...